Thank you for having me. I, um, I haven't been to New York for almost a decade, so I ha it's beautiful out. I won't tell you that it's beautiful outside today if you haven't been outside today, but um, <laughs> it was very lovely. We ran through the park this morning, and uh, it's just a treat to be here, and you guys look like a very warm and friendly audience. I was saying um, to Olga that uh, you never know where you're going to land, and sometimes it's a very formal lecture hall, so I'm very excited that this is a kind of a casual setting, and I hope we get a chance to actually have a little bit of a dialogue about the school and kind of I'm hoping to have some time for questions at the end. Um, I love medical education, that's my only disclosure. I like to think about kind of uh, building things and kind of disrupting and innovating, and so I somehow landed in this role with the medical school about almost four years ago um, and have been uh, learning a tremendous amount as we try to launch a medical school basically from scratch. So I'm going to share with you a little bit today about our school. I'm going to share with you a little bit about the why. Um, talk you through Kaiser Permanente if you're not familiar with KP because I think it's really an important uh, kind of culturally and structurally that, that, that that's part of our conversation. And then hopefully get a chance to share all the, all the fun stuff we're doing. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit facetious. Is anybody from Kansas? <laughs> okay, I'm not from Kansas either. I'm born and raised in California. So uh, several years ago now, um, as we were thinking about launching the school, there was a lot of discussion to try to sort of convince our board of directors and our health plan board of directors, um, you know, why why we were going to do. A medical school and obviously we actually have a 70-year tradition in GME so we've been training residents and other people's medical students for a long time but the uh, Dr. Bruce Blumberg uh, kind of shared with the board that you know if you really wanted to train an Olympic skier and you wanted to make sure that you were going to have you know the fastest kid on the downhill or you were going to use you know slalom or you name it you probably would think about if you were in Kansas shifting the environment to think about how to really best train somebody that you're looking for that skill set and that future potential. And so kind of similarly, we thought a lot about what we have to offer as an as a integrated care delivery system and what we train our residents in, which is really kind of um, systems-based practice, health system science, um, population health, and thought, you know, maybe there's something to this about actually changing the environment earlier. So we decided to launch a medical school, uh, which sounds easier said than done, but I'm going to describe to you a little bit today about KP. I'm going to articulate why we're starting a medical school and some of the context of med ed reform and some components of the school that is, um, I guess, some of the transformations going on in med ed that are shaping the way that we structured our school, and we'll show you that too. But first, I don't know if you usually pair share, but I don't like to give a talk the whole time. So I'm going to ask you guys to spend maybe not a full five minutes, but maybe two to three minutes. Find a friend, the person next to you, three, three together are OK. And just think about if you had a blank slate, there was no research building. There, was no, uh, there were no departments of anatomy or biochemistry. Um, there was actually no structure that you had to work on. Uh, what would you do? What would be kind of exciting to you? What would you try to kind of blow up or disrupt if you could do whatever you wanted and you were going to build a new medical school? So just think about it for a second. Uh, what would you keep, remove, or add? And what barriers might be kind of limiting your disruption? A couple things that they talked about what, what that they would do. You were just all talking. <laughs> Strong. Yeah. Find a way to take the enormous amount of knowledge and boil it down to give we were talking, give to the person, the young doctor, enough skill, knowledge, and attitudes to handle the universe out there. Okay, so there's too much knowledge. There's it too much knowledge. We have to distill it. We, we need have to figure to out what they need and versus how do everything we, know we want to give them. What's so important? What is the most important? What is the most important? Is it the, is the stuff on the boards? Is it not the boards? Good, good, great point. Others. Can we get rid of the boards? In that part of get rid of the boards. <laughs> yes. Um, that was six months of basic nursing science, then two years of clinics. Okay, so six months of nurse nursing science. Well, you know, basic anatomy and basics, uh, basic, uh, and then go. And then go clinics, and then have a year of intense basic science. 
then then oh, intense after the clinic. Okay. okay, I heard something back here about below. No, no, no preclinical. Yeah, we were like no preclinical. No preclinical. <laughs> no basic science. No. No. Uh, others. So I would say blend it together. Blend it integrated. In, in a way that. Okay. To because yeah. I think I want to do. Most students when they're coming in, they already have some kind of basics, but if you want to introduce them and make the changes. Okay. Okay. What are the barriers? Money. Money. Space. 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 Old structures. Old cultures and embedded structures. Old cultures and structures. Say a little bit more about the structures. I feel like we have a, a, an academic medical center that has a definition and a description and a culture and beliefs and values. So an act, okay, embedded, all of it. Embedded in all that. Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Other things. We thought a much stronger emphasis on outpatient primary care, okay. um, break down the silos, okay. and admit more B students, which I thought was great. <laughs> admit more what? B students. Oh. It was really interesting when we started because um, we kind of wanted to blow things up too. We thought, okay, maybe they take step one before they start. Maybe mm. they take all their foundational science through Khan Academy, and I mean, but people were having heart attacks in the room. But what could you do? Could, what can you shorten? How can you reduce the time or the money that it costs to go to medical school for a learner? How do you make sure that you know clinical experiences are kind of upfront? And then these barriers kept coming in: licensing and accreditation, board scores, reputation, admissions. Um, thinking about the diversity that we wanted in our learners, and knowing that that means in some ways that we have to sort of we, you can't just assume that everybody get, is going to come in with like a biochemistry background, right? We wanted kind of people coming from the humanities and with a really different lens to the way that they're coming at medicine. And that also means that you, you have to make sure that you have some structures in place to support learners of different, uh, different levels. So I'm going to pause on the curriculum for a second and I'm going to talk about KP just to see all kind of thinking similarly. So Kaiser Permanente is an integrated care system. So I work for the medical group. There are Permanente medical groups. Northern California is the Permanente medical group because we are first. There are other medical groups throughout the United States. The health plan and the hospitals are kind of linked together. So this is our insurance plan and our hospitals. And we all contract mutually every year exclusively with one another to deliver care to our members. And we have uh, over 12 million members. Um, and there's this you know, incredible emphasis on essentially um, caring for our populations from kind of cradle to grave and being responsible for um, maintaining health, prevention, um, but also the delivery of whatever care that they need and in the, you know, highest quality, best care experience, highest, you know, level of safety. Um, and also trying to contain costs, not just so we can contain costs, but because, as we know, right, healthcare costs are going up exponentially. And so our goal is to make sure that our members can afford our healthcare, and that means you know continuously reworking our system of care so that we can um, really be more efficient and effective. And I know these things are going on everywhere. This is kind of the language of medicine these days, but. When we are so closely linked and we're not working in a paper service system, it really shifts the way that you can deliver care. And I think, I feel like we have something pretty special that we're doing that um, is now being replicated you know, worldwide. And they're you know, talking about, as we continue to talk about healthcare transformation, the eyes are a little bit on Kaiser Permanente, which is kind of a fun place to be. So this is our, these are our different regions highlighted here. So we're in Georgia, Colorado, Washington State, um, Northern California, the Mid-Atlantic states, the Northwest, this is mainly Oregon, Hawaii, and then Northern and Southern California are clearly our biggest two, two areas. We have 20,000 doctors, 38 hospitals, 52,000 nurses, and 650 clinical buildings. So it's huge, right? And yet, the goal is to be sort of one, one big system, that your card works everywhere, that your care is seamless, um, and this is logistically um, fun, actually. It's, it's, it is a constant challenge. Um, How did you get into Eastern? Uh, you know, Over here, right? This is the place right here. Um, this was, so the CEO of Southern California is the CEO for Georgia, the physician CEO. 
And this was, a, I think, an opportunity to buy a plan that looked kind of similar to ours several years ago. DC was actually fairly deliberate that we thought if we really want to influence lawmakers mm -hmm. and policymakers, that there's really, they really, we want to get the people who are making the laws and policies to be members of KP so that they understand the care delivery system. So you wanted so DC. Fairly, so we wanted DC. That was fairly intentional. The secret sauce that I talked about, founded on the principle of preventative health and community-based medical care. Um, primary care is really the crown jewel. I don't think our primary care doctors would tell you that they feel like the crown jewels every day because they're working super hard. Um, but the emphasis is really on uh, the medical center home and primary care. The concept of kind of the rising tide raises all ships culture. So I came from an academic environment where, you know, it was... Um, it's interesting, my experience in academics was that you'd pick up the phone and somebody would try to block you, right? And in other fee-for-service environments, you'd pick up the phone and 70 people would want to consult because the money's available, like that's where the consult money comes from. In our environment, it's taking care of the member and wrapping a team around. And it, it leads to very different types of conversations and phone calls and consultant interactions that it, it, it just culturally feels very different. And then we work in a, you know, we were the first people with Epic. We've been uh, up live with Epic for 12 to 14 years now. Very data-driven, technology-enhanced, looking at like advanced alert monitoring, um, home-based care, uh, lots of telephone and video visits, which gives us an opportunity to think about kind of transforming care delivery outside of just the hospital setting. Question? Is it for profit or not? Um, the physician group is for profit, then the other groups are the hospital health plan or nonprofit. And that's really important because that's actually how we get our funding for education. Any questions about Kaiser Permanente? Yeah. The last quote said prioritization of resilience. What does that mean? So, a lot of emphasis now on the phys in the physician medical groups thinking about uh, joy and meaning in medicine. So, uh, a strong emphasis on wellness in Northern and Southern California. Um, resilience, decreasing burnout. There's there's a lot of interest. I think for probably the first five years that I've been with KP for about a decade, the first five years that I was there, I think it was a lot about um, very oriented entirely towards the care delivery for the patient. I feel like in the last five years, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to, to have a, a practice for 30 years plus um, as a physician. And so there's more and more support thinking about how to have a sustainable career as a doctor or a health provider actually within our system. So when you say like preventative health as a doctor perspective, do you like what do you the doctor do? So um, we have a, um, a system in place where the the our delivery system supports the physician to make sure that things like our HEDIS measures. So um, hemoglobin A1C is at target, blood pressure control, particularly around care disparities, so blood pressure control in our African American patients, um, immunizations, cancer screening, like that's all something that has basically been automated and is instead of just the doctor who's the primary care doctor's responsibility, we can expect that if our our you know 75 year old guy who never goes to his primary care doctor lands in ophthalmology because he needs new glasses that the optometrist will actually ask him to get his colon cancer screening done and so it's kind of this shared model around preventative care and we have a lot of uh, a lot of stories that come out where it's sort of saving lives but it's it's kind of everybody's touch not just the responsibility entirely of the of the primary care physician I don't know if that resonates is that something you guys do too? Not really. <laughs> I, I, we forget. Like it, it's, it's good. Okay. So I want to spend one second to talk about our GME tradition. So we have 70 years of GME programs. We have uh, about 100 residency programs spread through our network. We have over 700 residents, 120 fellows, and we have somewhere around 1,000 medical students who come in from other schools, so Stanford, UCSF, UC Davis. UCLA, USC, Loma Linda, um, all their students rotate through us as their primary sites. So we've been teaching other people's medical students, right? And then confusing the heck out of our faculty because USC and UCLA have different models and different assessment structures. They start on different days. So it's a little bit crazy depending on where you sit and what institution you're teaching. Um, and we love our medical students. So we thought, you know, maybe it's actually time to do a school of medicine. 
So I'm going to pause there again and think about another metaphor. So my, my husband is a high school basketball coach, um, volunteer, freshman high school basketball coach. And kind of on the heels of the, the Final Four and Virginia's win, I was thinking about um, something that he says frequently, which is that um, depending on when you get a kid into your system, let's say this is a basketball player, they come in with um, sort of poorly taught or um, individualistic tendencies. So he talks a lot about eighth graders who've been told that they are the greatest basketball players ever. They have a private coach, their parent, you're kind of laughing and nodding, you know this eighth grader. I know this eighth grader too. So they've had a coach, they've been you know, the best, they have, um, you know, they're award winning, they spend all, you know, all four seasons in basketball and um, they come into freshman tryouts and they're actually not a very great basketball player. So depending on what they've learned, they don't play as a team very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what my husband likes to talk about is having to retrain them or reteach them so that they can actually play basketball the way that he wants them to play basketball as part of a team in sort of a high school environment, which is probably going on to more of a collegiate environment. And so wouldn't it be great if, and this is happening, these, these high school programs are going upstream, right? They're trying to figure out how do you train people sooner so you don't have to unlearn the bad habits and sort of reframe the way that, that, that um, the basketball is taught. And so we had a very similar thought, which was with all these students coming in and trying to give them the KP Kool-Aid, how do you think about meeting them upstream, whether it's actually in pipeline programs, which we're also focusing on, or whether it's through the medical school, which is what we're talking about today. So many different calls for reform. Everybody has seen that book. If you haven't read it, you should. And these ideas about what is academic medicine, this article was really interesting. Chris Castle, who I think was here, wrote an article called If We Keep Doing What We're Doing, We'll Keep Getting What We're Getting, A Need to Rethink Academic Medicine. Medical education, part of the problem and part of the solution. And then health professionals for a new century, thinking about what it means to be interdependent and in the health system and how do you train learners for that. So these are some of the calls for reform. Thinking about continuity, relationship-based care, thinking about how do you ground education in the sciences of learning, which looks really different than kind of our lecture hall, um, you know, science, histology, embryology, biochemistry structure that, we, that most of us trained in. Thinking, for independent, thinking about competency-based, independent, time-variable progress, right? So do you have to go to medical school for four years? Could you go for three if you used to be a nurse? Could you go for two? and go into a residency program that's going to catch you with a really great safety net to know kind of what things you're great at and what things you're not great at and how to grow you? Does everybody need to know absolutely everything? Do we want to differentiate pediatricians earlier or maybe surgeons earlier, get them kind of going onto these long, especially for surgery, right, these seven-year careers plus where they're going to be in training forever? Does everybody need the same thing? Thinking about team-based, comprehensive care, patient-centeredness, workforce and societal needs, a lot of things coming out internationally about embedding our learners more in, in uh, rural care, um, because frankly, there's enough doctors in cities where we're really having a hard time is delivering care where we don't have sort of the population density of physicians. And then really focusing on social determinants of health and health equity, and this has been a really fun thing for us to think about to tie into our new school. We did an ethnographic study in 2015-16 um, where we interviewed I think nearly 30 residents and students and the, we wanted to know sort of from a design thinking standpoint if the student is your end user for medical school what does a student really want right and it's funny because we don't really ask them very frequently we involve them in our curricular reform but we don't usually start at the design phase and ask a learner like what do, what do you want what is medical school what should it be and the things they came out with were fascinating. They said, fix it. Please fix it. It is so broken, and you're killing us. You're absolutely crushing us. Replace this traditional concept of status as an individualist who gets an A, right? I get an A. I'm graded on a curve. That means somebody else is getting lower down on that curve because of my success. That sort of cutthroat culture, right, the pimping culture, they don't want any of that anymore. They want to think about how to progress in their in the way um, in in their own like growth of knowledge and skill, so that they become 
as good as they can be in their own due course of time without caring that, that you know, Dr. Jones next to them looks completely different. They're going to get to the same end point. They, they want to help each other get there. They're really interested in partnering with their teachers. They do not want that sort of white coat hierarchy. They want you know, somebody they can rely on, who's invested in them, who cares about their journey uh, to becoming a physician, and they want outstanding mentors and role models. Um, they want to be engaged in the healthcare system at all times. They do not want to sit in a classroom. They don't want, you probably know this, right? They don't want to go to lecture. They want to watch things that they need to watch on double speed. And they want to see patients and they want to see them all the time. And they want to, to design their learning around the patients that they actually, that's why they went into medicine. Lots of conversations about diversity, lots of conversations about resiliency. Um, and they want to all be doctors in something else. So we're starting to see kind of, it's not even the millennial, right? What's the generation past millennial? Z, 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 Gen, I'm like, it's like X, Y, Z. Okay, we're going to go into numbers soon. They're, they want to be doctors and something else, whether it's they have global health careers or they're going to be researchers, a lot of interest in leadership, MBA programs. Like they, they want to figure out how are you going to grow me into you know, my best self and that includes skills that are not just about clinical knowledge and clinical um, skill. This is a slide, I don't know if those of you who know Jen Gonzalo from Penn State, he talks a lot about this. He's done a lot of work uh, introducing health system science over the past probably three to four years as part of the AMA uh, Reimagining Medical Education campaign. He talks about kind of the current medical student priorities, right? This is the old way, these basic clinical science courses, grades and boards, and then basically the goal being, you gotta get into the best residency program. Reality is, there are lots of great residency programs. The other reality is, at the end of the day, you're gonna get a job and you're gonna work in it for 30 years. And this whole way that we sort of get to get to, get to the next step, it, it kind of blows up when you realize it's, it's a pretty long journey, right? And so we're burning people out in this model. And so instead, how do you balance the basic clinical and health system science? How do you develop patient-centered skills how do you think about creating the best doctor possible and maybe not matching at the very best program? And this is hard to undo. And you talked about the structure and kind of that we're academic. Like, well, how do you undo this feeling of like what success looks like um, and think instead about what kind of doctor do I want? So we looked at three key kind of transformations as we were on our journey and we thought about this piece around the educational sciences and clinical learning. So Laban Wagner, um, Carol Dweck, um, Andura, there's a number of, of important contributions when you look at educational science that talk about the relationship that occurs between a learner and their teacher. We talked, we, we looked a lot at longitudinal and integrated learning, so spacing learning over time to make sure you're getting a lot of repetition interleaving so that you're, you're, you're sort of um, scene switching and coming back to um, whether it's you know, clinical practice in uh, maybe pediatrics and then the next day in OB and then you come back to pediatrics and how do you sync it all together so that what the student is seeing is really comprehensive and breaking down these silos of the individual sort of uh, science departments and even medical departments. And then we looked at LIC principles. So I've been working with LICs for about 10 years. I looked at your curriculum this morning, and you guys have kind of these modules, right, where they're sort of neuropsych, outpatient medicine, inpatient medicine, looks like five weeks and five weeks, and then there's an optional LIC that's like a 13-week ambulatory, nodding, I'm somewhere close. Okay, so the LICs that we're talking about are the sort of year-long, um, structures, I'm trying to think, who's familiar with the, the year-long LIC model? Mm -hmm. Hands. Okay, couple. Okay, so an LIC that's longitudinal blows up the traditional clerkship year and looks at instead of doing, you know, eight weeks of this and then eight weeks of peds, eight weeks of medicine, eight weeks of surgery, or however you guys have even in your modules, they put the students into a half day of clinic in each of their core clerkships. And in a given week, the students will actually do um, pediatrics in the morning, and then uh, OBGYN in the afternoon, 
Tuesday might look like medicine in the morning and psychiatry in the afternoon, and they rotate and they, they're caring for patients over time, over the course of usually a year. And so this continuity model, which came, we started at UCSF about 12 years ago, Harvard, Cambridge started it uh, several years ahead of us, is starting to really demonstrate these um, kind of profound outcomes, preserved empathy, um, decreased kind of uh, hidden curriculum. The students seem to be preserving sort of their sense of self and identity as a physician. They don't seem to have as much burnout. And then they have these really level working relationships with their preceptors so that instead of kind of that hierarchical pimping model, they're working with somebody who knows like, actually, you're really terrible at the neuro exam. You can't hide from me and hope that I don't ask you a question because I've seen you do a neuro exam now you know, six times for the last six weeks and you don't get it. So let's back it up a step, right? So you're not hiding from what you don't know. You're actually embracing somebody who's going to help you learn what you need. I was the person hiding in the back, like hoping to God nobody asked me a question on neurology. So I don't, I don't know if anybody else is like fabulous at neurology, but you don't learn a lot if you can't admit that you have a, learning, a deficit in your knowledge, right? So um, I think our current structure is a little broken. The second thing that we've really been looking at is this um, transformative idea about health system science. So who's familiar with health system science? Yes. Okay, health system science is kind of, you guys, all of these things look familiar, right? They're all health policy, systems improvement, population health, healthcare value, quality improvement, performance improvement. These are all words that we sort of hope we're teaching. I think you guys in your third year have, it looks like a week where the students come through and they do like kind of QI principles. Um, the reality is, is when we're heading out into practice now, and maybe not in residency, but most of us now as practicing physicians are spending a lot more time thinking about this world than we thought we were going to. Because even 10 years ago, quality improvement was kind of a new thing, right? It was Bob Walker talking about, um, you know, why, why quality mattered. It was sort of the to Eros Human reports coming out almost, almost 20 years ago now. Health system science is a way that we're thinking about as a pillar of education. How do we teach this and how do you teach it longitudinally and, and over time? So the functional competencies mean our students need to actually know this and they need to understand why and how it relates to the care that they provide and the knowledge and skill of clinical medicine. And then there are all these foundational competencies. How do you teach leadership to medical students? How do you teach people to think in a systems context? How do you teach people to work interprofessionally, right? Our, a lot of our interprofessional programs, you kind of get together with the nursing school maybe like twice, whoops, and hope that like in some sort of a simulated environment where you're both seeing a patient that you understand what that other person's role is. But the reality is, is you don't, at least our learners weren't. And the third thing is thinking about this clinical learning environment. So this is what Rena was talking about with the structures in place. These are sort of the personal, social, organizational and actually physical and virtual spaces. So what does technology look like and how does it support education? What does wellness look like? How do you think about a community of learning? And then how do you think about um, kind of some of the organizational practices that, that come from the environment that you're trying to teach in? So our mission, I'm going to talk about the school now, our mission is to provide a world-class medical education that ignites a passion for learning. We had to memorize this, by the way, for the LCME. I've forgotten it. <laughs> a passion for learning, a desire to serve, and an unwavering commitment to improve the health and well-being of patients and communities. And our vision is that our graduates will be a diverse community of compassionate healers, lifelong learners, and courageous leaders of change within the profession and society. I know a lot of missions and visions probably look like this, but from the beginning, to design a school to try to get to this product has been really different than trying to get a product out of a, a structure that already exists and just make little tweaks along the way. Our school is based in Southern California, but it's a national medical school, meaning that our students will actually be going out and learning and all, all across, you saw our little map, all across our region. Right now, that probably will be in their third and fourth year. Um, but our hope is actually that over time we might be able to create a school that actually capitalizes and utilizes all of our hospitals and, and <coughs> There's 48 students in our first class, 
We're opening in 2020. We just got our LCME accreditation with our yeah, preliminary accreditation with no citations, which set us up for um, a fairly terrible next step where our dean thinks that that's normal and that's actually <laughs> very abnormal. So we feel very excited um, and uh, it was a, a huge, a huge slog. So we learned a, just a tremendous amount. Um, I think what's really important is that we're not training our own students. People ask us for our own doctors. People ask us constantly, like, is this just a pipeline? Are you just doing this because, you know, you guys, KP, you need more physicians? But we have 20,000 doctors, and there's 48 students per year. So we could never keep up with what we actually need. And our hope is actually that we're changing future doctors who are going to go out and change practice elsewhere. So very aspirational that by learning in our environment, whether it's through undergraduate medical education or graduate medical education, that these folks are going to leave and say, huh, I didn't see this this way when I was training. What about this? Why can't we do it this way? And share that with kind of the world. You may have seen the newspaper. We were in the New York Times recently. I know we can't catch NYU right now, but we are for the first five classes all the way through tuition free. So our school is not run by our health plan and it's not run by our doctors. It's actually a separate entity that is uh, funded by our community benefits. So we have a nonprofit entity that has to give away a certain amount of money every year and it's on the order of like, I think it's billion, something billion. It's a lot of money that we give away. I should know that number next time I give this one. Um, the school is funded by community benefit and it's now the fourth player of the KP sort of trio. So hospital, health plan, medical group, medical school. So completely removed. The dean, doesn't, the dean doesn't have a reporting structure. The dean is our dean, but has relationships with the board of directors, and we have our own board of directors. Um, but they have relationships with the, the boards of the health plan and hospital and with the physician group. How many will get that grant and aid for living of the 48? So the first... The bottom uh, sentence. The, we'll provide generous grant and They're aid. hoping that most... Of, they're actually hoping that all of the students will be covered for the first several years as well. So they're being covered not, not only for tuition, not but, only for, tuition but, but for, for living. living expenses to offset. And I think they're going to be grants, not loans. There may be some loans. And what is your goal for the classes after the first five? My goal would be that everybody's tuition free. Um, I actually think that we may find that. that we're able to do that, yeah. But right <clears throat> now, in terms of just the ask for money and the budget, which is now set for, we have a 13-year approved, approved budget. Um, it's not currently in the, it's not currently in the proposal. We anticipate that this is going to mean that we're going to have about 10,000 applications that come to us in July. <laughs> and we're doing a holistic admissions process, which means uh, our admissions team, who's currently being hired and trained, uh, is going to have a lot of work to do, right, to get to 48. And we're hoping for a very diverse class, and we're hoping for a class that really will, um, it's probably going to be many California kids, um, but it's not, well, not exclusively. This is our founding dean and CEO, Dr. Mark Schuster. Um, Dr. Schuster came from Harvard. He's the former chief of general pediatrics and the vice chair for health policy, and he has this really amazing research um, program that he's done internationally in looking at child, adolescent, and family health, and very closely aligned with some admissions from KP. So he's been in place for, I think, almost 18 months, and then our team of Dean Letts um, are coming, the most recent one started yesterday um, from Columbia, and uh, folks are coming really from all over national schools um, to help us found our school, which means we have Kind of every several weeks, a new person kind of coming into the fold, a shift in culture where we're starting to be uh, academic and kind of KP merging to develop the school. Um, and honestly, the pace is just it is flying. So everything from um, designing what the furniture is going to look like for the school, designing our HR processes, designing our faculty handbook, the curriculum, of course, um, it's just, just a tremendous amount. Our website, we've learned a ton.
Any questions so far? I'm going to talk a little bit about the curriculum. I want to save some time. So we have three pillars in our curriculum. There are no departments um, of like basic science. There are three departments and three pillars. Our departments are the Department of Biomedical Science, Department of Clinical Science, and the Department of Health System Science. We're the first Department of Health System Science in the nation. Biomedical science is actually all of our foundational or basic sciences and scientists who are coming um, from primarily a teaching background. Some of them have some foundational, some like lab-based work that they've done, but many of the people that we're hiring into our biomedical science department, they're teachers. They've really taken to education. So whether it's an anatomist or a physiologist or a biochemist or a pathologist, they're coming in and, and they're going to be primarily teaching without with um, a goal towards research, but research that will be primarily focused on education. Our clinical science faculty is going to be enormous because this is really probably, I think we're expecting at least probably 600 physicians to be in our department of clinical science. Our biomedical science department is probably going to be closer to like 30. Um, our clinicians are going to be um, teaching in the school and in the clinical practice space. And our health system science department is run by Dr. Paul Chung, who came from UCLA, and really thinking about what it means to have a department of health system science and how it becomes a course that's woven through the fabric of our curriculum over all four years. So even defining what health system science means to us and how we're going to deliver that content has been just super, it's really fun to think about how you kind of blow up medical school. So our approach is all case-based teaching all integrated, so they won't sit, there's actually not a lecture hall in our new school, I'll show you the school at the end. Um, the cases are woven around a patient, the teachers who are teaching the cases will be in small groups of eight, and the small groups will be led by one biomedical scientist and one clinical scientist. And so, um, the, there's a doctoring fabric that's kind of woven through each week that parallels the case, so there's not sort of a, it really, you'll be learning not sort of what should come first, but what's coming up from the case that, that's presented that week. And then marching through over time where, you know, cases will continue to spiral and scaffold and build on themselves. Um, so all of our health stuff together, mainly kind of flipped classrooms, we're doing some TVL every week, team-based learning. Um, a significant amount of simulation and a, and a huge sim space. Um, we're teaching anatomy without cadavers, so we have plasmids, which are actually cadavers that have been sort of um, permanently preserved, um, but we don't have an anatomy lab. There's amazing stuff coming out with augmented reality and virtual reality in terms of teaching anatomy, um, and I think we're right on the cutting edge of that. Case Western's been sort of leading that, some of that work. It's really fascinating. Um, it actually gives you three-dimensional um, capability that I think surgeons tend to love. I couldn't ever learn the pelvis. It was very hard for me to sort of how, how it's oriented, kind of getting in, and it didn't really come alive from the Netter books. I don't know if anybody else was learning anatomy that way. But and they've done that with Microsoft. Yes. Yeah, it's really phenomenal. Our longitudinal integrated clerkships, so our core clerkships start the first week of medical school. They don't start in year three, they start in year one. Our students are going to be immersed in a um, half day a week with their primary care uh, preceptor, mainly in ambulatory practice, and they'll have that preceptor for two years in either family medicine or internal medicine, and they'll carry through, that's their core clerkship in medicine. In the second year, I'll do a little deeper dive into this, the students actually will have four additional core clerkships, a half day each week. So OBGYN, psychiatry, surgery, and pediatrics. And they spend only one week of the clerkship in an inpatient setting. So primarily ambulatory, matched with one teacher over the course of a year or two years for primary care. And then they have a uh, one half day a month in a continuous service learning environment that's attached to their medical center. We have coaches. Uh, the students will be coming back for something called REACH, which I'll show you. These are, this is really hard, so I'm going to kind of blow this up, but four years, they're done with their core clerkships at the end of year two. They'll take step two, 
right here, I'm sorry, step one, uh, at the very beginning of year three, and then they had this incredible opportunity to do really individualized deep dives in their in years three and four. We expect them to be in a longitudinal specialty clinic for some of the time, and there are 18 weeks of required clinical experiences, a sub-I of their choice, a sub-I in medicine, neurology, um, and some inpatient surgery time. Um, but primarily, this is all kind of open for them mm -hmm. to, to do scholarly work, um, a capstone project that's expected, and a really deep dive into some of their health system science content. This is what our first uh, year looks like. So integrated sciences are the course, mainly in small group with some sim and some lab, and then their half day a week of their longitudinal clerkship or their service learning experience. And a lot of independent time for them to study. I'm gonna keep that up for a second. Yeah? You, were, you mentioned earlier how a lot of med students nowadays wanna watch lectures at double speed in their PJs whenever they want. Yeah. How much flexibility, especially in a flipped classroom setting? I mean, like the. So the they have day. to do it for pre work. So the lecture component will be something that they watch before they come to their small groups. So they won't, sit, they won't come to a lecture. That'll be either watched or taught prior to them coming in and then actually having to sort of wrestle with the material. So will those groups. lectures be given in the studio? Some of them may be pre recorded things that we, you know, like this talk, right? They'll watch something. Um, I think more commonly we're trying to use existing resources from whether it's like Khan Academy actually has medical school online with some fabulous lectures that frankly I'm not sure we can improve to do ourselves. I'm not sure it's necessary. Um, a lot of um, they'll still be reading obviously and book prep and assigned chapters but the pre-work going into each day is actually fairly significant which is why there's the independent time. How do you know how the independent time will be utilized? We don't. We trust them. <laughs> I'm a product of the Case Western program with the yeah. new curriculum. Yes. Where the program went from five days a week to three and a half days a week with a day and a half of free time. But it was monitored. You had a project. Uh -huh. You were supposed to accomplish something. Though it was free time, it was still supervised. Mm -hmm. Is this going to all be uh, student independent? Mm -hmm. Be interesting to see. Uh, how, Hard, they do right? how do you how do you know what they're doing? What if they go to the dentist or they go jogging? Like, is that yeah. is that okay? Is that all right? It's okay with me. I mean, they have to show up and perform. So whatever that means to me, I mean. I, I remember being a medical student. You can't. You, even if you're going for a run, you still know you're up to 1 a.m. because you have you know four hours of pre-work to do for their class. I don't think that they're going to be. I think that we have to give them the flexibility to be adult learners, and then support them if they're not succeeding at being adult learners. And if you find that they don't pass step one, mm -hmm. what will you do? So we have a number of. Um, built in, uh, whether through um, you know, simulated testing and OSCEs or whether it's some of the prepackaged MDME you know, practice exams, ways to track whether they're on target. And so we have, with the, they have coaches that they're assigned to and then built in remediation. So it may be that if they're not succeeding, this time comes back a little bit to us for remediation and additional coursework. But this is the plan for most of them. Questions? Uh, how about people? Oh, no. Who's next? You're fine. Question about. I have a couple questions. First of all, so for each 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 pre work they have to do will get sort of evaluated or tested the next morning in like a TBL kind of format. Uh huh. Some of the some of the classes will be TBL with the with the IRAT and the GRAT. That, you're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna follow, uh, follow that model. Yeah, and then some of the testing a lot. They'll actually some of them will take pre pre session. Quizzes and the teachers will know sort of how and, students and then we'll have remediation for that if they like are failing like at each step. As in the small groups that with eight students um, and two teachers, it's actually very faculty heavy. Okay. And so the, the we will be able to monitor, you know, pretty pretty real time okay. who's not up to speed. And my second question is, I noticed like a six week board prep thing. 
Is that's, that sponsored by you or is it on their own? Or are you going to give them money to go to a uh, store? I haven't decided, but I think we're going to sponsor it and actually have it. Run be, it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll Question. Are you giving grades? Uh, not in the first two years. And currently have not. So our, our core clerkships right now will be pass fail. Um, and we're working on whether or not we're going to have grades in phase three for like the sub eyes and some of the advanced coursework. Probably because coming from a world that is focused on GME and having to think about sorting through applicants, we don't want our students to be, this is one of the barriers, right? We don't want them to be at a disadvantage when they're applying to residency programs if all of their grades are pass fail. But our, our goal in the first two years is learning for learning. So it's not learning for grades and performance. Um, so almost like this is the UCSF model where the fourth year clerkships will have right. a grade and the third years right. Grade. So we're seeing this in other places that the core clerkships are, are no longer graded um, at a number of schools. Well, they're experimenting with it. We'll see mm -hmm. how it goes. Yeah, question? I have a question for your faculty, especially for the um, longitudinal integrated clerkship. Is your faculty coming from the I guess it's the physician group. The for that. Mm -hmm. So how did you get buy-in from them? Because if, I don't know, they might have seen half the patients that afternoon, that morning, that they would have, if they didn't have a first year medical student. Yeah, them, so they so all have work. 40 minutes of block time that was negotiated with their um, their chiefs and their medical centers, their, their like physician CEOs. Um, and that model has worked for us for like, we have a, a UCSF LIC that's based in Oakland that I ran for five, five or six years. That's the same model that we've used there. And so it's created, um, what we find with LICs is that the, the, the students start to give back about halfway through the year. They actually can see three or four patients on their own. Maybe not in year one, but by year two for the common things and primary care clinic or common things in pediatric clinics, the students actually can do fairly well, which means that the, the physicians actually can be slightly more productive. Um, you just have to find that balance so they're not, you know, working into their lunch hour and then working into their six o'clock hour afterwards, right? I want to be cognizant of your time. Our LIC is at six of our medical centers in Southern California. They're all kind of a, a hike. So we've had to think a lot about how we schedule their time and students will need cars most likely. And then we talked a little bit about our service learning opportunities. We do have built-in reach weeks that happen basically once a quarter during all four years where the students will come back. These are reflection weeks with their coaches, a lot of health and well-being, emphasizing personal and professional development. And the coaches are actually trained as coaches. They're going to be given like a, a fairly extensive um, faculty development series. I'm going to run through a video for you guys just so you can see what the school looks like because it looks pretty different.
and that's kind of the end of my talk. I, I really wanted to, you know, introduce you to KP, introduce you to the school, get you thinking about sort of disruptive innovation, and, oh. and then thinking about some of the, the <laughs> transformations in, in, uh, in healthcare that we're aiming towards. So I'm happy, to, I'm here for another hour. I'm happy to take questions. If you have to leave, you won't hurt my feelings. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and if you can stay, I'm happy to keep chatting because I'm sure there's some questions. Thanks for coming. Thank you.